Well, Secretary Zinke, first of all, thanks very much. Great to be with you. Us. Yeah, it's great to have you back at Q2 again. Well, it's great to be back in Montana. And tell me why. Uh, you know, I was in Fort or uh, Mount Rushmore and just coming across the border to uh, Zeta. You know, Montana is a little different, yeah. uh, especially when you're home. Uh, but Montana, you know, beautiful country, very, very large. It's kind of one small town with really long streets. Great people. It, it definitely is. Well, uh, let's jump right into uh, the Interior Department. And you not only manage uh, a large contingent of people, I mean, you have like 70,000 employees and, and managing uh, d uh, vast areas of acreage of federal land plus uh, offshore, but you are dealing with hot button issues. It seems like something different every day, every week. What's the current hot button issue that's uh, highest on your mind right now? Well, you're right. Interior is 12 time zones. So it stretches from the Virgin Islands all the way out to Palau. Uh, one fifth of the territory of the United States falls under the interior. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the offshore oil and gas as well as we have onshore conservation, our park system, BLM. Uh, we also have the Indian reservations that were the trust uh, holder for Indian country. Uh, and the issues, you know, I can tell you the last year, I spent a lot of time on our two hurricanes. I spent a lot of time on uh, the Pacific looking at the rise of China and the influence they have on our territories. And I spent a lot of time on energy. Uh, today, uh, you look at where we are 500 days in, lowest unemployment uh, for blacks ever, lowest unemployment uh, for Hispanics ever, lowest unemployment for women, 21 years. Our GDP is at four. And on the energy portfolio, we're producing about 10.7 million barrels a day. We've surpassed Saudi. At the end of this year, we will be the largest oil and gas producer in, this, in, in, in the world. Uh, first time in 60 years, we're exporting liquid natural gas. But it's not about oil and gas, it's about the American energy portfolio. We also have the largest offshore lease in the East Coast uh, depending on, on wind, uh, our solar picture, and we're all the above. Uh, the grand pivot uh, is now, I think the energy portfolio is good. We've shored up, uh, we have a good plan on recovering of, of U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, China remains an issue, uh, but certainly on a presidential level, uh, we're not looking at toe-to-toe at -to -toe nuclear combat with North Korea. Uh, they're not launching missiles. They have dismantled some of their capability. Uh, too early to tell a long-term outcome, but no one is talking about imminent destruction of 50 million people. Uh, that, that is enormously large, certainly uh, in, in my lifetime. Uh, and we're making a pivot now to look at our infrastructure on our park system and reorganize to be better stewards for the next 100 years. So how in the world do you prioritize something like that on a day-to-day -day basis? You're, I mean, you're talking about global impacts, uh, impacts into uh, certainly the, the vast area of the United States. Um, what's a day-to-day -day, uh, look like as far as how do you select what gets your attention today? Well, uh, you look at the Trump administration. Uh, the president, uh, the campaign promises. Uh, and he intends to fulfill those campaign promises, and he's, in, he's fulfilled many of them. He uh, writes an executive order uh, tasking all the, the cabinet members to execute those campaign promises, our, our portion of it. And if you want to learn what the president's doing and thinking today, just follow his tweets. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, I follow, very simple, I follow the executive orders from the president my priority is the president's priority. Yeah. And then I have a passion for public lands. Uh, I, I don't want to sell or transfer public lands, but I do want to manage them. And as a kid that grew up in Montana, you know, it hurts when you see the forest fires, the devastation year after year after year. I mean, folks that live in Missoula uh, are leaving during the summer when they should be out fishing and hiking and enjoying the outdoors. Uh, they're always face burns. A lot of it is management techniques, getting rid of the dead and dying timber, uh, making sure that public access uh, is, is focused on. Uh, 
uh, making sure our conservation plans are in place, wildlife corridors. I signed a secretary order on wildlife corridors to identify wildlife corridors and put conservation plans in place to include mineral withdrawals uh, and shaping the next hundred years. You know, he asked uh, my priorities. Uh, one is to be a steward of our greatest holdings, which I think is our public lands. And I'm a strong admirer of Teddy Roosevelt. I spent time recently with Simon Roosevelt and T.R. the Fourth on looking at the next hundred years. You know, how do we protect those key components of our ecosystems? How do we reorganize so the government listens to the local voices, you know, rather than having it DC centric? Mm -hmm. uh, and then shoring up our infrastructure of the parks and our wildlife refuges. Uh, we've opened up 250,000 acres of our wildlife refuges back to hunting. Uh, I think 38 refuges are now available for hunting and fishing. And it really is about re-looking you know, public access. A lot of America is getting older. We have a lot of injured veterans that are disabled. And so looking at uh, opening up some roads, uh, the, you have now mountain bikes that are electric, which provide access to people that, that ordinarily would not have it. You know, and having the dialogue of which trails to open up, you know, for those individuals uh, to make sure that the public lands remain not only public, but also are available for public use and to enjoyment of the great outdoors. Let's jump on back to uh, energy development. Um, and uh, there's been a shift in policy, obviously, from the Obama administration to the Trump administration on getting uh, the permitting process um, uh, shaved as far as time and such. What have been your priorities to try to manage energy development better for all in the United States? Well, being energy dominant is important. Uh, one, environmentally, it's better to produce energy in this country under reasonable regulation than watch it get produced overseas with none. Uh, economically, having low-cost energy uh, allows us to pay better wages and be a juggernaut of manufacturing with our technology. And lastly, morally, uh, I never want your kids, your grandkids to ever see what I've seen. And being in a position where we're not held hostage by foreign nations on our energy is a big thing to me personally as a former commander. The regulatory framework you know, shouldn't be uh, arbitrary and it shouldn't be adversarial. Uh, our regulations on, on energy and throughout the sector of our economy, we need to be better partners. We need to look at incorporating best science best practices, uh, best technology, innovation, in order to make sure that the outcome is better safety, uh, better reliability, and better environmental stewardship. Uh, but sometimes the government regulatory framework has been shaped to be punitive, and it doesn't allow s you know, new science, uh, new technology to be incorporated in energy production. And a fascinating look of what's happened in about 500 days is the American energy technology innovation has been unleashed. Uh, again, we will be at the end of this year the largest producer of oil and gas, but we're also catching up on alternate energy. Our technology on solar is getting a lot better. We're leading the world in energy technology, but we need a distribution you know, system. Gas uh, is you know, low cost probably the bridge fuel reliability counts, you know, our coal and nuclear, because, you know, a gas plant is only as good as that pipeline coming into it. Uh, you cut off that, that pipeline and that whole facility is going to shut down. An advantage with the reliability of coal, you can stockpile, the same thing with nuclear, and that has to be a part of the mix of having reliable energy, and there's a lot of of cases where you know cybersecurity or or physical harm can be can be done, and you know if you're a city like Pittsburgh or New York, not having power in the winter has consequences. Very much so. Uh, tell me or talk to me a little bit about coal in the in the um, the portfolio if it's in all of the above. 
coal uh, being a reliable source of energy and certainly uh, has a major impact here in Montana, South Central and, and, and Eastern Montana especially and into Wyoming. Um, do you feel that coal has a prominent role or is it a decreasing role in that portfolio and, and where does the Interior Department uh, play as far as the future of coal? Well, coal's under enormous pressure for a, for a lot of reasons. Uh, one is the gas price. Uh, two, it's a death of a thousand cuts. But the reliability of coal uh, to date has not been replaced. Uh, a strong market overseas, and it is better to ship cleaner coal overseas than have China or South Korea burn dirtier coal. So environmentally, the coal in Montana and Wyoming is cleaner, higher grade. I think it's worthy of investment because the BTUs are there. Mm -hmm. You know how to make cleaner uh, coal. Uh, there's some fascinating innovation on CO2, on injecting CO2 to produce better wells, uh, recapitalize on that. CO2 is a commodity, so there's some interesting technology. I think it's worth always across the board to invest in technology. Uh, ultimately, we want to produce the cleanest most efficient, cost-effective, and reliability energy. Uh, coal is still a part of that mix. We're going to turn the page completely now to uh, the National Park System. And, and within driving distance of uh, us today, we have two of the grand doms of, of the Park Service in Glacier and Yellowstone. Yep. Um, if you went there today, you would be uh, joined by thousands and thousands of other people. There's an enormous pressure on our parks. I'm, I'm curious to, to hear your take on how are we ever going to be able to manage uh, the number of people, which we seem to have record number of visitors attending every year. Uh, I w can it sustain itself in, in the present form, or are there tweaks that need to be made to try to manage the n number of people and the impact that they have on our park system? Well, let's look at the present infrastructure backlog. We're about $11.7 billion behind in maintenance repair of our park system because they are being loved to death, to your point. 300 million visitors through our park system uh, last year, and the numbers are going to grow. Now, we need to catch up our infrastructure, and the President's budget is the largest investment in the history of this country uh, on our parks, our wildlife refuges, and Indian education. So let's catch up on infrastructure, and then let's look at the public lands around the park in a reorganization. There's no reason why a trailhead can't begin on a f adjacent Forest Service property or adjacent BLM and transition into the park and out. There's no reason why we can't use our public lands more effectively by making sure the trail systems connect. Uh, we can do a lot better. Uh, on our parks that, that have you know enormous amount of people, uh, we think we, we should go green on maybe the top 10 and do a what I call a transporter. If you've been to Glacier and the red buses, mm -hmm. well, we can modernize those to a, maybe a Tesla powertrain uh, with an experience that delivers people so you don't have the, the traffic where every parking lot's not full, but you have to have a system. And then you have to make sure that the trails themselves uh, are tied in because you don't want a bus with 70 people getting dumped off of a trailhead and your experience is walking with 70 people. So you know a lot of it is just technology of looking at your app on what trails have high density and where they're at and to make sure that the park experience, uh, which I believe is sacred, should remain. Uh, it, it's a finite resource so there is a capacity and a limit but certainly we can do better on our current approach uh, and open up some more trails, uh, but also use the public lands around it as more of a system-wide uh, approach. And then if uh, Glacier is, is very crowded in, in this area, it offers some choices uh, to other parks that, that are lesser known, uh, other areas, so people can enjoy the great outdoors and our public lands. You and I might know that, but can you convince other people who serve in the Congress to support funding of something like that that maybe not be as interested or uh, may have not had the experience of being in a national park? Well, I, I can tell you that parks 
uh, in our public lands is not a Republican or a Democrat or an independent issue. It's an American issue. And by and large, everyone loves their parks. There's a bipartisan bill. I can't lobby for it, uh, per the rules, but uh, Senator Alexander from Tennessee, it's a bipartisan bill, which we strongly support, which would go a long, a long ways to helping fund the money up front in order to invest. And I think our parks are not an expense. Uh, they're an investment. And some of it, too, is giving our superintendents and our field managers more authority to make these decisions without having to go all the way up to D.C. for a decision that they could make and they should make on the front lines. A uh, couple of personal questions. You've been in uh, politics now for about 10 years. You went from the Montana State Senate to a cabinet position under the Trump administration. Um, that's a pretty, pretty quick rise to one of the top positions in the country. Um, give me an overview of the ride. It's been an exciting journey. Um, and you, I view it from representing the people and, and service. You know, in this environment, I've been shot at before. I'm very comfortable being shot at. Uh, people ask me, what's easier, being a SEAL commander or a cabinet member? And in many ways, a SEAL was actually easier because when people shot at you, you could shoot back. Uh, but I enjoy, I enjoy working uh, for the president. Uh, he is delightful to work for. Very much CEO by the numbers. He follows the numbers on the economy. He follows the numbers on energy. Uh, I'm passionate about public land, so I think it's a good fit in the interior. And certainly for Montana, uh, one that cares about the outdoor experience, it's, it's been great. Uh, I remain friends uh, with, with congressmen and senators on both sides of the aisle because I think interior is one of those departments that it should be bipartisan on it. Uh, I'm, I'm enjoying it. Uh, you can ask my wife. She's probably not enjoying it as much, uh, but it's, it, it's, been, it's been fun. Uh, I try to have I try to you know, have fun at the, at the job, uh, but a lot of responsibility, and as we've kind of pointed out in the beginning of the interview, um, the spectrum of, of, of things that Interior deals with every day, and it depends on where you are. And, you know, Montana focuses on BLM and perhaps the park and fish and wildlife and Indian Affairs. If you're down in Louisiana, it's Bessie and Boehm and offshore. If you're in on the East Coast, a lot of our battlefields uh, tell a story. We have uh, in the park system, we have civil rights, uh, you know, areas that tell a story. And the, I think the park system uh, overall has done a spectacular job of telling a story. Whether it's a out west with Pinchot and our large parks, to even in, in urban cities on some of our historical sites uh, that are relevant to the America that we enjoy today. Can you take us to your first cabinet meeting when you walked in? Um, that that's, uh, m must be a, a, a quite a moment in your lifetime that uh, after your confirmation hearing and you uh, get called into your first cabinet meeting with the President of the United States. Well, in the order of uh, precedents, you, you sit according to your seniority. And it's the President, uh, the Secretary of State, and then myself on the other side is Mattis. Uh, I fought with Mattis in Fallujah. Uh, I know John Kelly very well. And it was interesting the first time I'm, I'm looking at uh, Steve Mnuchin across the Secretary of Treasury, uh, immensely qualified. Uh, certainly understands the larger financial workings of monetary policies. You have Wilbur Ross, very successful people. And my thought was, why am I here? <laughs> because you, you look at the talent that he has amassed, in it, and he really has am amassed enormous talent, and talent in the area of which they're called to serve. Uh, Sonny Perdue, as a Secretary of Interior, farmer, veterinarian, very astute in the workings of agriculture and the importance of agriculture. So I, th I think Montana uh, should be pleased to have someone in the industry. And he's been out to Montana a couple times uh, because Montana, we do things a little differently uh, out here uh, in our view on agriculture is somewhat different than Georgia. 
Uh, but it was, it was delightful, and the president is full throttle. Uh, he's full throttle. And I've worked for generals and admirals that are battle rhythms that are 18 hours a day, day after day after day, serving the country. Uh, no one is, is working harder uh, than President Trump. And I've never seen anybody with better instinct. Uh, he has great instinct on what's right. And he doesn't mind you know, pressing ahead on, on that instinct. And clearly, I think he was, he's in the office because uh, America was not satisfied with the direction we're going. It was time to change. It's time to drain the swamp. And you just look at the regulations alone. When he came in and said, for every one you put in, I want to take out two. He's taken out 22. Uh, so even, even that has surpassed uh, his expectation. But he, he holds the cabinet members, i got to tell you, uh, to the numbers, uh, just like a business. Uh, CEO. You have to deliver. Okay. Uh, we had talked a, a little bit about the tumult of the day and, and the criticism that comes your way as part of the job. Um, can you give us an indication on uh, trying to manage that day to day? Because there's a number of different areas. People say you're too friendly for Montana, that there, and there have been travel issues, there have been a number of things that have come under scrutiny. Um, were you expecting that going into the into the job, and how do you manage that on the day to day? Well, you know, I've been shot at before. I'm very comfortable with it. So they make an issue of my travel. So it goes through an IG report. At the end of the day, the IG report, I followed all policy, procedures, and law. They made an issue about Hatch Act. It goes through an investigation, complete. I followed all law, uh, absolutely exonerated. I followed all rules, regulations. Uh, you know, it's, I don't know how many, how many millions of dollars they spent on this thing, but it's a, it's a waste. You know, I have a full team of, of ethics professionals that look at my schedule. I have a whole team of, of lawyers that look at my schedule. I'm scrutinized. I think this administration is scrutinized more than any administration in the history of this country, and it's fine. Uh, but you do right and fear no man. And it is better to charge up a hill under fire than cower in a foxhole. And, and Interior, under my watch, is going to do the right thing. Uh, we're going to listen to local communities. Or we're going to be an environmental steward, second only to probably Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, we're going to make sure we're, we're not held hostage by foreign entities on our energy needs. We're going to do it right. We're going to bring back multiple use uh, to our public lands, and we're going to reorganize to be the better steward in the next century. Uh, that's where Interior is going under my watch. You mentioned reorganization, and, and when that came out that you were looking at uh, changing uh, how things are run, that to many of us looked to be uh, uh, almost too big of a job to get done. Where, where do you start with that? in trying to reorganize an agency that has, n has not changed very much. In 150 well, years. Over time. Yep. And so you're looking at trying to move uh, a large uh, contingent of employees and agencies and organizations all across the country. Where are you at in that and, and what are you doing well, with it? Be bold. Um, and be as bold as Roosevelt was 100 years ago. And over time, what you have is a, a large organization that is very stovepiped. The Fish and Wildlife Service doesn't talk to the BLM very much. They don't talk to the National Park Service very much. And public lands, let's say wildlife corridors, for instance, affect all bureaus. Uh, what happens upstream affects downstream. Uh, you, you talked about the challenges we have in number of people in our park system. Well, in order for a trailhead to start you know, on a BLM property and transit in and out of a park, the two bureaus have to talk. So part of the reorganization is almost what the military did in 1983, where let's look at areas we can do jointly, where all the bureaus uh, work together. Probably recreation, $887 billion industry. Our trail systems should connect, our bike systems should connect, our reservoirs should be used for boating, uh, 
public access on our, on our rivers so people can, can enjoy our, our rivers. Uh, conservation, wildlife corridors should be identified and conservation plans should be put in place to include mineral withdrawals to make sure those wildlife corridors remain healthy throughout time. Permits, uh, when you look at, you have competing agencies, who's in charge of a permit? Someone should be in charge. You know, from a SEAL commander's point of view, someone should be in charge. If no one is in charge, then no one, <laughs> then, then you can't get things done. So put someone in charge of uh, the permit. If it's a bad project, give it a thumbs down quickly. If it's a good project, give it a thumbs up, make sure it's mitigated, be a Boy Scout, leave your campground in better condition than you found it. But we can do things better, and part of doing things better is making sure the local community is a part of the decision making. Uh, there's no reason why it, it can't happen that way, but people get angry when Washington, D.C. makes these actions without local input. Uh, they get angry when the state has no say. So let's sit at the table on these decisions that affect an ecosystem. Let's get all the stakeholders together, uh, the environmental groups, the industry, and let's, let's carve the right path. And the one size doesn't fit all in Washington. So kicking some of the authority out and reassessing our front lines, making sure our front lines are healthy, that our front lines, we should have the right number of people to do the job, they should have the right funding and they should have the right authorities to make these decisions that are better made on the front line rather than Washington. And I have always said that if you don't know the difference between the Potomac and the Yellowstone, maybe you shouldn't be making the decisions in Washington, D.C. about the Yellowstone uh, because the Yellowstone's a lot different. Uh, the uses, as you know, you live, in, you live in Billings. Yellowstone's different. So it's better to, better to make the decision on the front line of, of people that are passionate about the Yellowstone River uh, than in Washington where it's just a piece of paper. And can you make it all happen? We can. Uh, well, uh, I work for a president that has signed an executive order uh, tasking me to do just that. Uh, and in the president's uh, tasking is looking at where the Army Corps of Engineers you know, some of those assets are better managed uh, by us, and some of them are better managed that we have or by the Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, National, National Marine Fisheries. If you have a trout and salmon in the same stream, you don't need two organizations managing the same stream. Uh, so how to, how to reorganize the, you have a president that is absolutely laser focused on it. You have a secretary that looks out the next hundred years and said we needed to be a better steward next hundred years. We also have an interior department that's fairly senior in that today 16 percent of, of interior's retirement age. In five short years 40 percent of interior, 40 percent is retirement age. So we don't have to rift anybody. Uh, as a person retires we can recode that billet, send to the front line uh, with that, the authority to get things done uh, and make sure that our public lands experience, our permitting, our conservation, our recreation are better suited for the next century. Okay, just a couple more on you. Um, can you do this for another two years as Secretary of Interior or six? Uh, is that something that you look at or is this more of a day-to-day -day, uh, focus? I, I will do it as long as the President uh, it's, it's comfortable in my leadership style uh, and we're getting things done. I enjoy the job as Secretary of Interior uh, primarily because what drives me is the passion for public lands and the frustration of not getting things done. Uh, you'll have to ask my wife uh, how long she can uh, sustain it but you know we try to get together as, as much as we can a lot of strain on the family. I'm gone uh, doing, uh, from doing the things that I like the most. Love the fish, uh, love the hunt, uh, love the hike. Uh, I don't get as much opportunity to come back to Montana as I would like. Um, but also, I have the opportunity to see a lot of the country I would not have seen. And I kind of go back to my experience of a congressman. You know, as a congressman, you represent the entire state. So I saw more of Montana 
you know, driving around, and it's a beautiful state. And I know Alzida and Hammond and Troy and, and Glasgow. I know people in, in, in every county as a result of being a congressman. Now as the interior, uh, the palette expanded. I've been down to the Everglades. I know really good people at the battlefield of Manassas and Gettysburg and Yosemite. And you look at the majesty of of America's portfolio. Uh, so that has been uh, rewarding. You will return to Montana? There is no doubt I'm going to come back to Montana. Uh, I don't think anytime soon. Uh, I have no doubt the president will be reelected uh, as long as I make the numbers and, and, and continue to, uh, to press ahead. Uh, but, but he's a delightful boss to work for. You know, people ask me, how's the president? Uh, the president is very engaging. Uh, he looks at the numbers just like a CEO would. Uh, he follows the economy numbers. He, he follows those things. He trusts his cabinet uh, do it, uh, but he keeps his cabinet accountable as well. Okay. Uh, I'll let you go on any one particular issue that you uh, th would want to address for viewers in Montana. Uh, that that you have a focus on right now? Well, uh, for Montana, uh, I focus on restoring trust uh, to make sure the cattlemen and the farmers and, and our recreation enthusiasts uh, know that I have their back, uh, that we are going to move ahead on creating more public access, uh, making sure we manage our federal properties better, uh, making sure we're good neighbors. You know, when you when you have a property that's adjacent to a federal holding, you know you shouldn't be the first to complain about weeds and about you know that we're not good neighbors. That our our fuel load is too high, and the threat of burn is from you know the the federal property that's on the other side of the fence line. So we need to be better neighbors and work with communities, uh, help communities with their trail systems, uh, and help Montana. Uh, which I, you know, I represent now our, our nation and territories and Indian nations. Uh, Montana is always in my heart. Uh, I'm glad to see Sperry uh, being built, and because we're the Trump administration, we're going to we're going to build it under budget and ahead of schedule.